Chapter Twenty Three of Beyond These Voices. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Beyond These Voices by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Chapter Twenty Three. Vera told her husband that she did not mind solitude, yet it was a face of ashen whiteness that he left behind when he shut the door of her dressing room after his hurried and cheerful goodbye on the first day of the Goodwood meeting. He was driving his sixty horsepower Daimler to Goodwood, steering for himself while the chauffeur sat behind ready for road repairs or to give a hand in carrying a corpse to the nearest hospital the speed limit was naturally disregarded as the thing that claude wanted was excitement the hazards of the road as they sped past hamlet and farm followed by the long white dust cloud that flashed across the landscape like the fiery tail of a comet, while startled villagers gasped and wondered if a car had passed. Peril was the zest that made the journey worth doing, to feel that his hand upon the wheel held life at his disposal, and that any awkward turn in the road might bring him sudden death. He was gone, and Vera was alone in the gloomy London house so much more gloomy than the vast halls and galleries of the roman villa where colossal windows let in vast spaces of blue sky here the heavily draped sashes emitted only a slit of sunshine tempered by london smoke she was alone but she told herself that solitude did not matter it was not solitude that weighed upon her spirits as she roamed from room to room in the emptiness and silence it was the sense of not being alone that weighed upon her it was the consciousness of a silent presence the invisible third who had come between her and her husband of late who had come back into her life in the noontide of her love while passion reigned supreme and the man she loved filled her world the shadow had been lifted from her path she had seen all old things dimly dazzled by the glory of her life's sun she had remembered nothing except her childish bliss with the boy who was to be her fate her life began and ended in her husband as it had begun and ended in claude rutherford when he was only her friend and companion, the light-hearted companion whose presence meant happiness. In the first two years of her second marriage, she had been completely absorbed in that transcendent love and in the ceaseless round of pleasure and excitements that her husband contrived for her, filling her days and nights with emotional moments with little social triumphs and trivial ambitions satiety came in an hour or it may be that it came so slowly and so gradually that there was an hour when vera awoke to the consciousness that she was tired of everything that the earth with all its changing loveliness its surprises of mountain and lake wood and river was but a sterile promontory and the blue vault above como only a pestilent congregation of vapors the suddenness of the revelation was startling but not the uncommon malady that afflicted the prince of denmark had been eating her heart for a long time before she was aware of its hold upon her and with the coming of satiety the distaste for amusement the distrust of love came the shadow memory that had been lulled sleep by the magic philter of passion awakened 
and was alive again she roamed the great silent house haunting with a morbid preference those rooms that were particularly associated with the dead man that range of spacious rooms on the ground floor where nothing had been altered since mario provana lived in them his library and the severe official-looking sitting-room adjoining where he was often closeted with his partners and allies his head clerks and managers his business visitors from vienna rome berlin madrid new york when the drawing-room had been transformed by a gayer style of decoration more in harmony with vera's frivolous entertainments claude had been urgent that these ground-floor rooms should be refurnished and every trace of their severe business-like aspect done away with and even certain priceless old masters that provana had been proud of dispatched with ruthless haste to christie's sale room but to his astonishment vera had told him that nothing was to be changed in the rooms her husband had occupied that all things touched or valued by him were to be sacred for this reason while approving claude's plan of color for the walls and draperies and carpets in the drawing-rooms she had insisted upon retaining the italian cabinets of ebony and ivory and the florentine mosaic tables the things that had been collected all over italy a century ago in the beginning of the provana riches and now solitary and dejected she moved restlessly from room to room sometimes standing before one of the bookcases in the library and looking along the titles of books that she had learnt to love in those far-off days before she had been launched by the disbrows a frail cockle shell spinning round and round in the society whirlpool while she and her husband were still unfashionable enough to sit together in the autumn twilight or to spend tete-a-tete evenings in this solemn-looking room his mind was with her there to-day in the july sunshine as it had been in those evenings of past while he was a living man he remembered speech was in her ears to-day grave and earnest telling her the things she loved to hear widening her view of life opening the gate to new knowledge the knowledge of authors she had never heard of the story of heroes and statesmen philosophers and poets whose names had been only names till he made them living people people to be admired and loved he had taught her to comprehend and love dante to appreciate the verse of carducci the prose of manzoni he had taught her to revere carvor to adore st francis of assisi to weep for savernola and gordio bruno he had made italy a land of genius and valor a land alive from the alps to the adriatic with heroic memories he had made her know and love the history of his country almost as he himself loved it and now his spirit filled the room in which the man he had lived his shadow had come into the house that had been his and had taken possession of the place and of the atmosphere whatever might still remain of the undisciplined love the passion of unreasoning youth that she had given to her second husband she could never again release herself from that first marriage tie it was the bond of death she went into the dining-room when luncheon was announced carrying a volume of browning and made some pretense of eating with the book open by the side of her plate 
a proceeding upon which the butler expatiated somewhat severely that afternoon as he lingered over tea in the housekeeper's comfortable parlor i don't know what's come over the missus he said as he took an unwelcome stranger out of his second cup and parenthetically this tea isn't what it was mrs manby she don't eat enough for a tomtit let alone a sparrow and she's falling back into that dreamy way she was in when provana was in america and for a long time before that as you may remember that time when it was always not at home to mr rutherford she was trying to break with him said mrs manby i give her credit for that so you may but that kind of trying was never known to answer when once they've begun to carry on remarked mr sedgwick i've watched too many cases not to know the inavailability of them he added having picked up the modern jargon more or less incorrectly the long day wore on to the melancholy twilight and vera was dreading the appearance of her maid to remind her that it was time to dress for her solitary dinner she had talked lightly of having lady susan at her disposal but she knew that her friend was at the very hour contributing to the vivacity of one of the smartest of the goodwood house parties and would be so engaged till the end of the week she had thought in her weariness of the mill round that solitude would be better than the society that had long become distasteful but she found that in the melancholy hour between dog and wolf the shadows in a london house were full of fear vague and shapeless fear an oppression that had neither form nor name and that was indefinitely worse than any materialization she was standing by the window in her morning room looking down into the gray emptiness of the wide carriage way when no carriages were passing and on pavements where unfashionable pedestrians were moving quickly through a drizzling rain when a servant announced father hammond can you forgive me for calling at such an unorthodox time i happen to be passing your door as i have called several times at the right hour and not found you i thought i would try the wrong hour no hour can be wrong that brings you said she in a low voice as she gave him her hand and the words sounded more sincere than such speeches usually are i am glad to hear you say as much as i believe you in the whirlpool of frivolity a few serious moments may have the charm of contrast i have done with the whirlpool tired of it after only three years there are some of my flock who have been going round in the same witch's dance for a quarter of a century and are still in the crowd on the broken i can but think you have made the pace too fast since your second marriage or perhaps it is your husband who has made the pace you must not think that we both like the same things we are companions now as we were when i was a child at disbrow park and when we were so happy together her eyes filled with tears oh how far away that time of innocent gladness seemed as she looked back what an abyss yawned between then and now i have distressed you the priest said gently taking her hand no no but it is always painful to look back father hammond drew her towards the sofa by the open window and seated himself at her side 
let us have a really friendly talk now i have been so lucky as to find you alone he said i am glad very glad that you are tired of the whirlpool for to be tired of but a bad kind of life is the beginning of a better kind of life you know what i think of modern society especially in the feminine aspect and how i have grieved over the women who were made for better things than the witches dance we have talked of these things in your first husband's lifetime but then i thought you were taking your frivolous pleasures with a careless indifference that showed your heart was not engaged in them and that you had a mind for higher things even your dabbling with mr simon's quasi supernatural philosophy was a sign of superiority his disciples are not the basest or most empty-headed among worldlings though they keep touch with the world in those days you know i had hopes of you but since you have been claude brotherford's wife i have seen you given up to an insatiate love of pleasure a headlong pursuit of every new thing the more extravagant and the more dangerous the more hotly pursued by you and your husband so that it has become a byword if the thing is to cost a fortune and to risk a life the rutherfords will be in it claude is impetuous easily caught by a novelty she said depreciatingly with lowered eyelids he was not always so impetuous rather a loiterer indifferent to all strenuous pleasures delighting in all that is best in literature and worshipping all that is best in art though too idle to achieve excellence even in the art he loved but since his marriage and forgive me if i say since his command of your wealth he has changed and degenerated you are not complimentary to his wife vera said with a faint laugh i am too much in earnest to be polite but it is not your influence that has done harm it is your money that fatal gold which has changed the whole aspect of society within the last thirty years a change that will continue from bad to worse as long as diamond mines and gold mines are productive and the inheritors of great names can smile at the vulgarity of millionaires who do them well and will give the open hand of friendship a host who to-morrow may be branded as a thief what does it matter if the thief has brought lord somebody's estate and shooting that and shooting that is among the best in england well it's all done with now as far as i'm concerned vera said wearily i used to go everywhere claude liked to go people laughed at us for being inseparable but i am sick to death of it all and now he must go to the fine houses alone no doubt he will be all the more welcome perhaps but i did not come to talk of trivialities or to echo hackneyed diatribes against a state of things so corrupt and evil that its vices have become the staple of every preacher's discourses cleric or layman i want to talk about you and your husband not about the world you live in since you have done with the whirlpool there is nothing to keep you from better influences will you let mine be the hand to lead you along the passive way of light and love the way that leads to pardon and peace vera turned from him trying to hide her agitation but the feelings he had awakened were too strong 
and she let her head fall upon the arm of the sofa and gave herself up to a passion of tears pardon she gasped amidst her sobs you know i need pardon we all need pity and pardon no man's life is spotless and the life you and claude have been living is a life of sin aimless sensual godless i have had a wide experience of men i have known the best and the worst and i have seen the strange transmutations that may take place in a man under certain influences how the sinner may become a saint and the saint fall into an abyss of sin but i have never seen changes so sudden and so inexplicable as those i have seen in your husband whom i have known and i think i may say i have loved from the time when he began to have a will and a mind i hope you do not blame me for his having left the monastery and come back to the world how can i blame you when his mother was the active agent she is a good woman though a weak one where her affections are engaged she was perfectly frank with me she told me how you had refused to use your influence to keep her son in the world and she loved you because she thought it was his love for you that made him abandon his purpose she rejoiced in his marriage but i doubt if she has been any more edified than i have been in watching the life you and her son have been leading since then no i do not blame you for claude's sudden breakdown but i deeply deplore that he should have turned back since i know that his resolution to have done with the world was a right one astounding as it seemed to me when i first heard of it i urged him against a step for which i thought him utterly unprepared i did not believe in his vocation but after consideration made me take a different view of his case i knew that such a man would never have contemplated such a renew renunciation without so strong a reason that it was my duty to encourage him in the sacrifice of the world rather than to hold him back i will say something more than this mrs rutherford i will tell you that if it was to make his peace with god that your husband entered the roman monastery he lost all hope of peace when he left it and he will never know rest for his heart and his conscience until he returns to the path that leads to the cloister claude is happy enough vera answered lightly he has so many occupations and interests he is not as tired of things as i am but no doubt i shall have to go on giving parties now and then on claude's account he is not tired of the maelstrom and it would not please him for me to drop out altogether and to be talked about as eccentric or not quite right she spoke with a weariness that moved the priest to pity and then he spoke to her as he had sometimes spoken in the past words that were profoundly earnest even eloquent for what highly educated man or even what uneducated man can miss being eloquent when his faith is deeply rooted and sincere and his feelings are strongly moved he offered her the shelter of the church the only armor of defense against the weariness and wickedness of life he would have led her in the passive way of light and love he offered her the only certain cure for that welt schmerz 
of which her husband had complained when he wanted to end his life in a cloister he had pleaded with her before to-day had tried to win her years ago when the pleasures of life had still something of their first freshness he had tried vainly then and his efforts were as vain as now she answered him coldly almost mechanically yes it was true that she was tired of everything as claude had been years before before their marriage as he would be again perhaps by and by but the church could not help her if she were to become a roman catholic it would only be in order to escape from the world to do as claude had wished to do and to make an end of life that had lost all savour but until she was prepared to take the veil she would remain as she was a believer but not in formulas a believer in the afterlife and in the influencing minds the putrid souls that had crossed the river i see you prefer mr simon's religion of the day before yesterday to take that of the saints and martyrs of two hundred two thousand years ago cyprian hammond said in his coldest tones as he rose to leave her you are as dark a mystery as your husband is god help you both for i fear i cannot the gray darkness of a wet summer night was in the room as vera rose to ring the bell and switch on the lamps the clear white light showed her face drawn and pale but very calm she held out both her hands to the priest forgive me she said the day may come when i shall ask you to open the convent door for me but i am not ready yet end of chapter twenty three Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 24 of Beyond These Voices This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Beyond These Voices by Mary Elizabeth Braden Chapter 24 The Goodwood of that year was a brilliant meeting. The winners were the horses that all the smart people wanted to win. The weather, with the exception of that first rainy twilight, was perfect and all the smart frocks and hats spread themselves and unfolded their beauty to the sun like flowers in a garden by the lake of como among the owners of winning horses mr rutherford was conspicuous you rich people are always lucky said his friends you never buy duffers and you can afford to pay for talent i don't suppose you make much by your luck but you have the glory of it the house in which claude rutherford was staying was one of the smartest houses between goodwood and brighton a house where there were always to be found clever men and handsome women musical people and painting people and even acting people people who could sing and people who could talk women who shone by the splendor of physical beauty and women whose audacious wit made the delight of princes it was a house in which cards were a secondary consideration but where stakes were high and hours were late lady waterbury the hostess expressed poignant disappointment at vera's non-arrival my poor little wife is completely run down claude told her she was a rag this morning 
and it would have been cruel to persuade her to come with me though i hated leaving her in london at this dismal fag end of the season i thought her pal susan amphlett would have spent most of the week with her but i hear lady susie is at the saxe and mandolins do you suppose susie would miss a good wood no not for friendship exclaimed sir joseph the jovial host one of the last of the private bankers of london coming of a family so long established in wealth that he could look down upon new money well there is one of our beauties ruled out i don't know what we should do if we haven't secured mrs bendelin it was just as well to ask her this year said his wife with pinched lips though it was sir joseph's idea not mine i doubt if the best people will care about meeting her next season what has mrs bendelin done to risk her future status claude asked and then with his cynical smile certainly she has committed the unforgivable sin of being the handsomest woman in london which is quite enough to set all the other women against her it isn't her beauty that is the crime but the use she makes of it she has made more than one wife i know unhappy and yet you ask her to your house sir joseph invites her i only write the letter so far she is just possible but if i have any knowledge of character she will be quite impossible before long let us make the most of her while her good days last claude said laughing i should like to make a sketch of her before the brand of infamy is on her forehead i have met her often but my wife and she have not become allies and if she is a snare for husbands and a peril for wives it is rather lucky that vera is not with me for after a week in this delightful house they must have become pals i don't think proximity would make two such women friends lady waterbury replied severely again if i am any judge of character i should say that vera and mrs belden must be utterly unsympathetic my wife and i have a friendly compact said sir joseph she may invite as many dowdy nieces and boring aunts as she likes provided she asks no troublesome questions about the pretty women i want her to ask and gives my nominees the best rooms poor aunt sophia had a mere dog hole last christmas sighed lady waterbury well didn't she bring her dog poor darling she never goes anywhere without ponto and of course she is a shade tiresome and it is rather sweet of joe to put up with her mrs belden may pass this time did i hear somebody talking of me cried a crystal clear voice and a woman as lovely as a midsummer dawn came with a swift step across the velvet turf towards the stone bench where claude rutherford and his host and hostess were seated they had strolled into the italian garden after an abundant tea that had welcomed the first batch of guests a meal at which mrs belden had not appeared preferring to take tea in her dressing-room while she watched her maid unpacked and planned the week's campaign the exact occasion for every frock and hat being thought out as carefully as the general in command of an army might consider the position of his forces it was to be a visit of five days and evenings and none of those expensive garments which the maid was shaking out and smoothing down with lightly caressing fingers was to be worn twice all of those forces had to be reviewed 
not a silk stocking not a satin slipper must be reported missing silken petticoats that rustled aggressively petticoats of muslin and lace that were as soft and noiseless as the snow whose whiteness they imitated fans jewels everything must be put away in perfect condition ready for a lady who sometimes left herself the shortest possible time for an elaborate toilet and yet always contrived to appear with faultless finish and this evening as she came sailing across the garden having changed her traveling clothes for a mauve muslin frock of such adorable simplicity that a curate's wife might have tried to copy it with the aid of a seamstress at eighteen pence a day she was a vision of beauty that any hostess might have been proud to number among her guests she took her seat between sir joseph and his wife with careless grace and held out her hand to claude rutherford without looking at him lady waterbury told me that you and mrs rutherford were to be here she said is she resting after her journey i am sorry to say she was not able to come with me not ill i hope not well enough for another goodwood the race weeks come round so quickly as one gets old sighed mrs bellenden there seems hardly breathing time between the two thousand and the ledger and while one is thinking about where to go for the winter another year has begun and people are motoring to newmarket for the craven the story of our lives from year to year is rather like a merry-go-round in a fair but mrs belden is too young to feel the rush too young i feel old ages old as old as rider haggard's aisha when the spell was broken and the enchantress changed to a hag but i am sadly disappointed at not meeting your wife she went on turning the wonderful eyes that people talked about with full power upon claude i wanted to meet her in a nice friendly house we have only met in crowds and i believe she rather hates me how can you imagine anything so impossible at any rate she has given me no sign of liking while i admire her intensely francis simon has talked to me about her i have had so much of the world the flesh and the devil that i want to know something of a lady whom he calls one of his beautiful souls upon this mr rutherford had to say something polite a something which implied that his wife would be charmed to see more of the lovely mrs bellenden people talked of mrs bellenden's beauty to her face it was one of the things which her own sex registered against her as a mark of bad style she might be ever so handsome other women admitted but she was the worst possible style a circus rider promoted from the sawdust to a mayfair drawing-room could hardly have been worse it was not long since this woman had burst upon the world of london a revelation of physical loveliness then felt they like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken there are planets and planets as there are skies and skies assuredly neither uranus nor neptune created a greater ferment in the world of the wise than was made by mrs belden's first season in the world of the foolish the phrase professional beauty had been exploded as vulgar and stale but the type remained under new names mrs belden was simply the new beauty invited everywhere the star of every fashionable weekend party every smart dance or dinner afternoon or evening 
to hear divine music or to play ridiculous games to be instructed about radium or to lose money and temper at bridge there could be no party really successful without mrs belden men looked round the flower garden of picture hats with a disappointed air if her eyes did not flash lovely lighting from under one of them impetuous youths made a bee-line for her and threaded the crowd with relentless elbows calmly ignoring their loves of last season and the season before last men are absolute idiots about that woman the last seasons told each other no one has a look in where she is mrs belden was a young widow a widow of two years widowhood the first of which it was whispered she had spent in a private lunatic asylum that's where she got her complexion said malice it was just as good as a year's rest in a nursing home and a straight waistcoat that's where she got her figure said envy she was now six and twenty a widow living in a small house in a narrow street like the neck of a bottle between park lane and south audley street with an income of two thousand a year but popularly reputed to be spending at least five thousand her reputation in her first season had been unassailed but she was rather taken upon trust on the strength of her houses where she was met than by reason of any exact knowledge that people had of her character and environment good-natured friends declared that she was thoroughbred a creature with such exquisite hands and feet and such a patrician turn of the swan-like throat could hardly have come out of the gutter and her husband had belonged to one of the oldest families in wessex so in that first season except among her rivals in the beauty show the general tone about her was approval then in her second year as the lovely widow things began to leak out unpleasant things as to the men she knew and the money she spent the hours she kept in the snug little house in brown street the places at which she was seen in london and paris chiefly in paris where people pretended that she had a pied de terre in the new quarter beyond st genevieve people talked but nothing was positively stated except that she did curious things and was beginning to be regarded somewhat shyly by prudish hostesses she still went to a great many houses smart houses and rich houses but not quite the best houses not the houses that can give a cachet and stop the mouth of slander she gave little luncheons little dinners little suppers in the little street out of park lane and her lamp-lit drawing-room used to shine across the street in the small hours as a token that there were talk and laughter and cards and music in the gay little room for tout de monde or at least for her particular monde she had a fine contralto voice and sang french and spanish ballads delightfully could breathe such fire and passion into a song that the merest doggerel seemed inspired but before this second season was over there were a few people in london who had dreadful things to say about mrs belden and who said them with infinite cruelty people for whose belongings son or daughter foolish youth or confiding young wife this lovely widow had been a scourge looking at the radiant being people did not always remember and some people did not know the tragedy of her youth she had been a good woman once 
quite good, a model wife. She had married, before her eighteenth birthday, a husband she adored, a creature of intense vitality, made of fire and light, sense and not mind. Love with her had been a flame, unwise, unreasoning, exacting, love without thought, wildly adoring, wildly jealous. A word, a look given to another woman, set her raging, and it was after one of the fierce quarrels that her jealous temper made only too frequent that her husband, handsome, gay, in flower of his youth, left her without the good-bye kiss for his last ride. He was brought back to her in the winter twilight, without a word of warning, killed at the last ditch in a point-to-point -point race, a race that was always remembered as the finest of many seasons, perhaps all the more vividly remembered because of that tragedy just before the finish when Jim Bellenden broke his neck. For some time after that dreadful night, Kate Bellenden was under restraint, and then, after nearly a year, in which none but near relations had seen her or had even known where she was, she came back to the world, not quite sane, and desperately wicked. That small brain of hers had not been large enough to hold a great grief. Satan had taken possession of a mind that had never been rightly balanced. I have done with love, she told her aim dam. She had always her shadow and confidant, upon whom she lavished gifts and indulgences. I can never love anybody after him, but I like to be loved, and I like to make it hard for my lovers. And then, in still wickeder moods, she would say, I like to steal a woman's husband, or to cut in between an engaged girl and the man she is to marry. I like to make another woman as desolate as I was after Jim was killed. But I can't make her quite as miserable. I am not death, but, with a little exulting laugh, I am almost as bad. There were people, a mother, a sister, or a wife, here and there in the crowd we call society, who thought Mrs. Bellenden worse than death people who knew the fortunes she had wasted, the houses she had ruined, the hearts she had broken, the careers she had blighted, and the souls that had been lost for her. End of chapter 24 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 25 of Beyond These Voices. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Beyond These Voices by Mary Elizabeth Brandon. Chapter 25 finding claude brotherford the most agreeable person in a house full of people mrs bellenden took possession of him on the first evening not with any obvious devices or allurements but coolly and calmly just as she possessed herself of the most becoming armchair in the drawing-room with such an air of distinct appropriation that other women avoided it you seem to be the only amusing person here, she said, as he came to her side after dinner. Isn't it strange that in so small a party there should be such a prodigious amount of dullness? Have you sampled all the people? There is Mr. Fitzallen over there talking to Lady Waterby, 
a musical genius who sets shakespeare's sonnets and heen's ballads deliciously and sings them delightfully you can't call them dull not while he is singing but i have heard all his songs ask him to sing presently and you will find he has brought a new batch then there is eustace lyon the poet mrs belden smiled do you know what they say of him she asked who can remember half the things people say of a genius who lays himself out to be talked about people are impertinent enough to say that he invented me that is to make him equal to jove nay superior for it was only incarnate wisdom not surpassing beauty that came from the brain of the thunderer i believe he did rave about me the year before last when i set up house in london went about talking idiotically called me a soothing gem and a hundred other ridiculous names but you don't mind you bear no malice no he and i are always chums i rather like being advertised gratis of course i treat him rather worse than my butler but i admire his genius and i let him sit on the carpet and read his poems to me before they go to the printer the poet joined them presently stalking across the room a tall slim figure with a pale lank face and long hair the composer joined the group five minutes afterwards and mrs bellenden having appropriated the only interesting men in the party sank farther back in her deep chair slowly fanning herself with her large white ostrich fan and as it were withdrawing her beauty from circulation other women might affect a little fan but kate bellenden knew the value of a large one when there is a perfect arm with a hoop of brazilian diamonds to be displayed i am only one of three claude said later in the week when one of the men chaffed him about mrs bellenden's favors she is a tete de leonette and at her best in a quartet one would soon come to the end of one's resources as an amusing person in a tete-a-tete -tete. he told himself that this peerless beauty might soon become a bore and he thought how much peerless loveliness there must have been in the royal preacher's palace at the very time he was writing ecclesiastes but all the same he found that mrs bellenden's conversation empty-headed as it might be gave a gusto to his days and nights during that goodwood week their trivial talk was pleasant from its very foolishness it was conversation without disturbing thought there were no flashlights of memory to bring sudden sadness a good deal of their talk was sheer nonsense of no more value than the dialogue in a musical comedy but it was a relief to talk nonsense to laugh at bad puns and to ridicule the serious side of life claude gave himself up to the mood of the moment and was at his best the irresponsible trifler the mocker at solemn things who had once been the desire of every hostess the light airy jester to keep the table in a roar the insidious flirt and flatterer to amuse women after dinner people told each other that rutherford was quite in his old form he had become horribly blasé and distrait of late as if all the sparkle had gone out of him under the weight of his wife's gold 
i don't believe a millionaire can be happy said the poet rutherford has been deteriorating ever since his marriage he rushes about doing things racing ballooning flying acting hunting shooting perpetual motion without gaiety he was twice the man when he was loafing about the world on fifteen hundred a year he is one of those men whom marriage always spoils replied the painter a chameleon soul that ought never to have worn fetters to chain such a creature to a wife is as bad as caging a skylark if he can't soar he can't sing i take it he will soon be out of the cage he has done two years of the married lover's business and we shall see him presently as the emancipated husband end of chapter twenty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty six part one of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jennifer painter beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braddon chapter twenty six part one mr and mrs rutherford were to winter in rome but there was the autumn still to be disposed of neither of them wanted marienbad they knew the place inside out and hated it and after wasting half an hour at the breakfast table turning over a continental bradshaw they had only arrived more certainly at the conviction that they were tired of everywhere the whole system of continental travelling was weariness and monotony the race to dover through the freshness of morning the race across sunlit waves to calais the hurried luncheon in the station and the three hours run to paris the huge gare du nord with its turmoil of blue blouses and loaded barrows the long drive to the hotel and the early start in the rapide for the south or the engadine express with the night journey through pine woods and the rather weary awakening at lucerne and then on to locarno and the great lake it had been delicious while it was new and while it was new for these two to be together wedded and inseparable for evermore but all the tracks that had been new were old now and though they were lovers still something had come between them that darkened love tyrol engadine cormeilleur no said vera throwing bradshaw aside no 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 the hotels are all alike and they make the scenery seem the same if one could be adventurous if one could stop at strange inns where one need never hear an english voice it would be better but it is always the same hotel the same rooms and the same waiters and the same food a little better or a little worse generally worse assented claude i've had a letter from aunt mildred this morning she wants us to spend august at disbrow would you like it he asked like it she echoed with her eyes clouding and a catch in her voice and then she started up from her seat and came to her husband and put her hand upon his shoulder think we've been getting rather modern of late claude she said in a low voice rather semi-detached disbrow would bring us nearer together again we should remember the old days disbrow by all means then he answered gaily we must never drift apart claude she went on earnestly with something of tragedy in her voice which trembled a little as she crept closer to him remember we have nothing but our love nothing else between us and despair don't be tragic vera 
he said quickly. Disbrow, by all means. Let us play at being boy and girl again. Let us do daring things on Oakhampton's Tuppany Hapney yacht, and ride horses that other people are afraid to handle. Let us put fire into the embers of the past. I suppose your aunt will have a few amusing people. It won't be the vicar and his wife and sister-in-law every night, and the curate at luncheon every other day. She will have all sorts and conditions, but that doesn't matter. I want to be with you in the place where we were so happy. You want to fall in love with me again? Well, it was time, he said half gaily and half sadly, but with always the air of a man who means to take life easily. August was August that year, and Disbrow was at its best. The great red cliffs, the azure and emerald sea, had the colour and the glory that had made North Devon fairyland for the child Vera in her one blissful summer. Other children, as they grew up, had a succession of delicious summers to look back upon, and could make comparisons, and wonder which was happiest. But Vera had only one season of surpassing joy to remember. She remembered it now, and contrived to draw a thick curtain over all other memories. Aunt Mildred was full of compliments. "'This air evidently suits you, child,' she said, when her niece had been with her a week. "'You look ten years younger than when I saw you last in London.' These two, who had begun to be tired of each other, were lovers again, and even memory was kind, even memory, the slow torture of thoughtful minds. They recalled the joys of fifteen years ago, and the joys of today were almost the same. Instead of the thirteen two barb, there were half a dozen hunters, thoroughbreds of fine quality, the disappointments of Claude's racing stud. Instead of the dinghy, there was Oakhampton's forty-ton cutter, a rakish craft that had begun life at Cowes. Another disappointment. There was the sea, and there was the moorland, and there were the patches of wood on the skirts of the park that had seemed boundless forests to Vera in her twelfth year. Her twelfth year. She remembered Claude's affected contempt for her youth. Why, you are only a dozen. And not a round dozen, only eleven and a half. No wonder your cousins in the schoolroom look down upon you. If there were still a nursery, you would be there, sitting on a high chair at tea, your cheeks smeared with jam, and a bib tied under your chin. She remembered all his foolish speeches now, and what serious insults they had seemed to her, or to the child that she had once been that innocent child whose identity with herself was so hard to believe. They were happy again. They were lovers again. Here they could say to each other, Do you remember? Here memory was a gentle nymph, and not an avenging fury. For Vera, who had hunted with her husband every year since their marriage, a season at Grantham, a season in the Shires, and two winters in the Campagna, it might seem a small thing to ride with Claude and a handful of squireens and farmers rattling up the cubs in the woods. Yet she found it pleasant to rise before the dawn and creep through the silent house and out into the crisp morning air and to spring onto a horse that seemed to skim the ground in an ecstasy of motion. Flying could hardly be better than to sit on this light, leaping creature and see the dewy wood rush by, and the startled rabbits flash across the path, or to be lifted into the air as the thoroughbred stood on end at the whirr and rush of a pheasant. A discarded racer was scarcely the best mount for pottering about after the cubs, but the pursuit of pleasure, that was always a synonym for excitement, had made Vera a fine horsewoman, and she loved the surprises that a light-hearted four-year-old can give his rider. And when the last cub had been slaughtered, to gratify Mr. Somebody's hounds, Claude and Vera had to ride to please their horses, 
and there was a spice of danger in the tearing gallop across great stretches of pasture, where the green sward sloped upward or downward to the crumbling edge of the red cliffs, and where they saw the wide blue floor of the sea, and the dim outline of the Welsh coast. One morning, when they were riding shoulder to shoulder, at a wilder pace than usual, and when Vera's horse was doing his best to get absolute possession of his bridle, she turned with a light laugh to her husband. "'Isn't this delicious?' she asked breathlessly, thrilled by the freshness of the air and the rapture of the pace. "'Would you mind if we were not able to stop them on this side of the sea?' "'Would I mind?' he echoed, looking at her with his careless smile, the smile in which there was often a touch of mockery. "'Not I, my love. It wouldn't be half a bad end, to finish one's last ride in a headlong plunge over the cliff, to know none of the gruesome details of dissolution, nothing but a sense of being hurled through bright air, forty fathoms deep into bright water. "'All the same, I don't mean these brutes to have their own way.' he concluded in his most matter-of-fact tone, with his hand upon Ganymede's bridle. They turned their horses and trotted quietly home, Vera pale and somewhat shaken by the excitement of the long gallop. They were near the end of their country holiday, and they were to part at the end of the week, Claude to spend a fortnight at Newmarket, Vera to start alone for Italy, stopping here and there for a few days, on her way to her Roman villa, where Claude was to join her, bringing his hunters with him, not these light thoroughbreds, but horses of coarser quality and more experience, fitter for the rough work of the Campagna. It had been Vera's own fancy to revisit familiar places in Italy. Claude had been urgent with her to abandon the idea, but she would not listen to him. I want to see San Marco, where I lived so long with Granny, when we were poor and shabby. Such a humdrum life. I sometimes wonder how I could bear it. Poor child, it was hard lines for you. But why conjure up the memory of things that were sad? Looking back is always a mistake. Looking back at the old, worn-out things. Going back to long-trodden paths. Nobody can afford to do that. Plus ultra is my motto. In Rome there will be plenty for us to do. We must make our third winter more astounding than either of the other two. I know lots of people who are to be there. All sorts of big pots. Pretty women, scribblers, painters, soldiers. You will have to invent new features for your evenings. New combinations of all kinds. And you must cultivate the new lights. When the season is over, people must go about saying that Mrs. Rutherford has made Rome. Vera looked at her husband curiously. How shallow he was, after all. How trivial. There were moments when her heart felt frozen. Dreadful moments of disenchantment, in which the man she had loved seemed to change and become a stranger. Moments when she asked herself with a sudden wonder why she had ever loved him. These were but flashes of disillusion. A touch of tenderness, a thought of all they had been to each other, and her bitter need of his love, made her again his slave. From the hour when he surrendered his chance of redemption, and came to her in her Roman garden, came to claim her with passionate words of love, he had been something more than her lover and her husband. He had been her master ruling her life even in its trivialities, with a mind so shallow that it could find delight in details, leading and directing her in an existence where there was to be no room for thought. He had planned their days at Disbrow so that there should be no margin for ennui. When they were not riding, they were on the yacht, racing round the coast to Boscastle or Padstow, or they were playing tennis or croquet with the house party, creating an atmosphere of excitement. They parted at Disbrow, Claude leaving for Newmarket, and they were not to meet till November, when he was to find Vera established in the Roman villa. All gaiety and excitement seemed to have left her with him. 
and Aunt Mildred remarked the change. "'You ought to have gone to Newmarket with your husband,' she said, "'though I have always thought it a horrid place for women, "'a place where they think of nothing but horses, "'and talk nothing but racing slang, "'and are as full of their bets as professional bookmakers. "'I hate horsey women, "'but you and Claude are such a romantic couple "'that it seems a pity you should ever be separated.' "'Romance cannot last for ever, my dear aunt. "'We have been married nearly three years. "'It is time we became like other people. "'I have just your feeling about Newmarket. "'I was keen about the stud for the first year or two, "'petting the horses and watching their gallops in the early mornings. "'And then it began to seem childish to care so much about them. "'And whether they won or lost, it was the same thing over and over again.' The trainer and his boys said just the same things about every success and every defeat. The crack jockeys were all the same, and I hardly knew one from another. I still love the horses for their own sake, and I am miserable if any of them are sold into bondage. But I am sick to death of the whole business. There was a fortnight to spare before Vera was to start for Italy and Lady Oakhampton wanted her to stay at Disbrow till a day or two before she left England. "'Portland Place will be awfully trist,' she said. "'I cannot see why you should go and bury yourself alive there for a fortnight.' Vera pleaded preparations, clothes to order for the winter. "'Surely not in London, when you can stop in Paris and get all you want.' "'There were other things to be done.' Arrangements to be made, Vera told her aunt. A certain portion of the staff was to start for Rome by direct and rapid journeying, Why she, with only her maid and a footman, was to travel by easy stages along the Riviera. Lady Oakhampton was rather melancholy in the last hour she and her niece spent together in her morning room. I'm afraid the pace at which you and Claude are taking life must wear you out before long, she said. You are never quiet, always rushing from one thing to another, even here, where I wanted you to come for absolute rest, just to dawdle about the gardens and doze in a hammock all the afternoon, with a quiet evening's bridge. But you have given yourself no more rest here than in London. O'Campton told me the way you tore about on those ungovernable horses, miles and miles away over the moor, while other people were jogging after the hounds or waiting about in the lanes. He said it was not cubbing, but skylarking. And the skipper complained that Mr. Rutherford insisted on sailing the yacht in the teeth of a dangerous gale. He is the generousest gentleman I have ever been out with, old Peter said. But he is the recklessest, and I wouldn't give tuppence for his chance of making old bones. Poor old Peter, sighed Vera. We often had a squabble with him, what he called a stand further. He's a conscientious old dear and a fine sailor, but he would never have found the shortest way to India. You wanted rest, Vera, but instead of resting you have done all the most tiring things you could invent for yourself. Claude is the inventor, not I, and it is good for me to be tired, to lie down with weary limbs and fall into a dreamless sleep, or into a sleep where the dreams are sweet. "'and bring back lost things. "'I should not say all this "'if I were not anxious about your health,' "'Aunt Mildred continued gravely. "'You look well and brilliant at night, "'but your morning face sometimes frightens me, "'and you are woefully thin, a mere shadow. "'It is all very well for people to call you ethereal, "'but I don't want to see you wasting away. "'There is nothing the matter. "'I was always thin.' I have a little cough that sometimes worries me at night, but that has been much better since I came here. You ought to take care of your health, Vera. You have a great responsibility. How do you mean? Have you ever thought of those who have to come after you? Do you ever consider that your splendid fortune dies with you, and that your power to help those members of our family who need help, alas, too many of them, "'Depends upon your enjoying a long life?' "'My dear aunt, I cannot promise to spin out a tedious existence "'in order to find money for poor relations.' 
"'That remark is not quite nice from you, Vera. "'You yourself began life as a poor relation.' "'I have not forgotten, and I have given my needy cousins a good deal of money since I have been rich, and of course I shall go on doing so. "'As your aunt and the most attached of all your own people, I must ask a delicate question, Vera. "'Have you made your will?' Lady Oakhampton asked this question with such a thrilling awfulness that it sounded like a sentence of death. "'No, aunt. Why should I make a will? I have nothing to leave. You know I have only a life interest in the Pravana estate.' "'Nothing to leave? But your accumulations, your surplus income?' "'I don't think I can have any surplus. Claude and I have spent money freely, at home and abroad, and I have given large sums for the foundation of a hospital in Rome, in memory of Mario and his daughter. Claude manages everything for me.' I have never asked him whether there was any money left at the end of the year. And of that colossal income, which you have enjoyed for five years, you have nothing left? It is horrible to think of. What mad waste, what incredible extravagance there must have been. You ought not to have left everything in Claude's hands. Such a careless, happy-go-lucky fellow ought never to have had the sole management of your immense income. It would make Signor Provana turn in his grave to know that his wealth has been wasted. He would not care. We never cared for money. Nothing left at the year's end. Nothing of that stupendous wealth. It is monstrous. Don't agitate yourself, dear Aunt Mildred. There may have been a surplus every year. I never asked Claude whether there was or not. But I shall always be rich enough to help my poor relations. There was no time for further remonstrance. Aunt Mildred parted from her niece with more sighs than kisses, though those were many. She perused the sweet pale face with earnest scrutiny, for she thought she saw the mark of doom on the forehead, where the lines were deeper than they should have been on the sunny side of thirty. She remembered the short-lived mother, the consumptive father. End of chapter 26, part 1chapter 26 part 2 of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer painter beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braddon chapter 26 part 2 Vera sat in a corner of the reserved compartment and read Browning's Christmas Eve all through the swift journey from the red cliffs of North Devon and the wide blue sky to the grey dullness of a London twilight. It was a poem which she read again and again, which she knew by heart. It lifted her out of herself. She felt as if she were out in the winter darkness on the wind-swept common, as if her hands were clutching the edge of the divine raiment. Was not that sublime vision something more than a dream in a stuffy Methodist chapel? Were there not moments in life when earth touched heaven, when divine compassion was something more real than the words in a book, when Christ the Redeemer came within reach of the sinner, and when faith became certainty? Nothing less than this. Nothing but the assurance of a living God could lift the despairing soul out of the abyss. The house to which she was returning was a house of fear, and in spite of all she had said to her aunt, she knew that there was no necessity for her return. The rich man's widow had nothing to do that a telegram to her housekeeper would not have done for her. But the house drew her somehow. She had a morbid longing to be there, alone in the silence and emptiness of unused rooms, without Claude, whose presence jarred in rooms where another figure was still master. She found all things in perfect order, no speck of dust in the rooms on the ground floor, 
her morning room brilliant with Japanese chrysanthemums. She went to the library after her solitary dinner. The evening was cold and fires were burning in all the rooms. She drew a low chair to the hearth and sat brooding over the smouldering cedar logs, perhaps one of the loneliest women in London. And yet not quite alone, since nothing that had happened in her futile life of the last years had shaken her belief in Mr. Simeon's creed, and she felt that the dead were near her. Julia, who had loved her, Julia, the happy soul who had known neither sin nor sorrow, the yearning of unsatisfied love, or the seething fires of guilty passion. Julia's gentle spirit had been with her of late, the spirit of her only girlfriend, and she had lived over again the tranquil hours at San Marco, the talk of books that had opened a new world to her, Julia having read so much, and she so little. Father and daughter had opened the gates of that new world for her. It was from them that the poet's daughter had learnt to understand and love all that is highest in the poetry of the world. If Julia had lived, she thought tonight as she crouched over the lonely hearth, sitting in that low chair in which she used to sit, as it were, at her husband's feet, sometimes in the dreamy twilight letting her drooping head rest upon his knee, while his hand hovered caressingly over the blonde hair. Had Julia lived, would everything have been different? Would Mario have loved and married her? And would they three have lived in a trinity of love? It seemed to her that Julia would have been a hallowing influence. They two would have been like sisters, loving and understanding the man who loved them both. No cloud of jealousy could have come between them. All would have been sympathy and understanding. That wall of separation which had risen up between her and her husband would never have been. Neither pride on her part nor distrust upon his part would have killed love. Julia would have sympathised with both and her love would have kept them united. She mused long upon the life that might have been, the life without a cloud. She thought with longing of the girl who had died sinless in the morning of an unsullied life. Was not such a life, wrapped round with love, and free from the shadow of sin, such a death, before satiety had come to change the gold to dross, the happiest fate that God could give to his chosen. And to think that I was sorry for her, that I pitied her for being taken from such a beautiful world, from such a devoted father. How could I know that death was the only security from sin? She sat long in that melancholy reverie, only rousing herself and taking up a book from the table at her side when she heard the door opening and a servant came in to put fresh logs on the fire. She told the man that her maid, Louison, was not to sit up for her. Nobody was to sit up. She would not be going upstairs for some time. She wanted nothing and she would switch off the lights. In a house lighted by electricity, the lights were of very little consequence. The footman took elaborate pains with the fire, piling up the logs and arranging the large brass guard that fenced the hearth, and then retired with ghostly step to remote regions, where his fellows were lingering over the supper table, some of them talking of the journey to Rome, and those who were to remain in charge of the house complaining of the dullness of a long winter and the low figure of board wages which had remained more or less stationary while everything else was going up by leaps and bounds. "'I'd leap and bound you if I had my way,' said Mr. Sedgwick. "'A pack of lazy trash. If I were Mr. Rutherford I should put a policeman and a bulldog into the house and lock it up till next May. You that are left have a deal too soft a time.' while we that go have to work like galley slaves. Three parties a week and a pack of Italian savages to keep up to the mark. Fellows who are more used to daggers and stilettos than to soap and water. 
better for a brigand's cave than a high-class pantry, and who think nothing of quarrelling and threatening to murder each other in the middle of a dinner party. There's no sense in a mixed staff. My pantry was a regular pandemonium last Christmas, and I wished myself back in sooty old London. Mrs. Manby was to stay in Portland Place, mistress of the silent house, with one footman, two housemaids to sweep and dust, and a kitchen wench to cook for her. She had saved money, and was independent, and even haughty. "'When I go to Italy it will be to the Riviera for my elf, and I shall go as a lady,' she told Sedgwick, who, notwithstanding his abhorrence of Roman footmen, liked his winter in Rome, as a period that afforded better pickings than even a London season, Italian tradesmen being more amenable than London purveyors, who had been harassed and bound of late by grandmotherly legislation. Supper had been finished in hall and housekeeper's parlour long before Vera left the library. It was after midnight when a sudden shivering, a vague horror of the silence came upon her, and she rose from her low chair in front of the dying fire and began to wander from room to room. The last of the logs had dropped into grey ashes in the library, and all other fires had gone out. The formal room, with large official-looking chairs and severe office desk, where Mario Provana had received formal visitors, was the abode of gloom in this dead hour of the night. And yet it was not empty. The sound of the dead man's voice was in the room, the voice of command, so strong, so stern in those grave discussions which Vera had often overheard through the half-open door of the library in the days when she had shared her husband's life, before fashion and disbrows had parted them. His image was in the room, the massive figure, the commanding height, the broad shoulders, a little bent, as if with the weight of the noble head they had to carry. He was standing in front of his desk, facing those other men with the grave look she knew so well, courteous, serious, resolute, and then slowly, with a movement of weariness at the conclusion of an interview, he sank into the spacious armchair. She saw him tonight as she had seen him often, watching through the open door, while she was waiting for the business people to go, and for him to join her for their afternoon drive. What ages ago, those tranquil days in which they had driven together in the summer afternoons. Not the dull circuit of the park, but to Hampton Court, or Wimbledon, or Richmond, or Esher, escaping from the suburban flower gardens to green fields and rural commons, glimpses of woodland even, in the country about Claremont. Their airings were no swift rushes in thirty horsepower car, but a leisurely progress behind a pair of priceless horses, with time for seeing wild roses and honeysuckle in the hedges, the dogs and children on rustic paths, and the peace of cottage gardens. She remembered how those tranquil afternoons had become impossible, by reason of her perpetual engagements, and how quietly Mario Provana had submitted to the change in her way of life, the succession of futile pleasures, the hurry and excitement. "'I want you to be happy,' he told her, when she made a feeble apology for not having an afternoon at his service. "'You are young, and you must enjoy your youth. Things that seem trivial and joyless to me are new and sweet to you. Be happy, love. I have plenty of use for my time.' That was in the beginning of their drifting apart. Looking back tonight, she could but wonder, as she remembered how gradually, how imperceptibly that drifting apart had gone on, until she awoke one day to find that she and her husband were estranged. He was kind, had only an indulgent smile for the folly of her life, but the happy union of their first wedded years was over and done with. In Lady Susan's brief phrase, they had become like other people and now she and Claude Rutherford had drifted apart, and were like other people. 
the reunion of a few weeks at Disbrow was but a flash of summer across the gathering gloom of their lives. He can be happy, she thought, brooding in the night silence. He cares for so many things. I care for nothing but the things that are gone. And then, while the clock of all souls struck that solemn single stroke, which has even a more awful note than the twelve strokes of midnight, she thought of her dead, all her dead. Her poets, Tennyson, Browning, Swinburne, men who had lived while she was living, and one by one had vanished, of the great tragic actor whose genius had thrilled her childish heart, of all that company of the great who had died long before she was born, and it seemed to her in her dejection as if the earth were an empty desert in which nothing great or beautiful was left. They had all gone through the dark gates of death, across the wild that no man knows. Her poet father, her lovely young mother, phantoms of beauty, distant and dim, evanescent shadows in the memory of a child. Yet, if Francis Simeon's creed were true, they were not gone for ever. They had not gone across the wild to dark distances beyond the reach of human thought. They were only emancipated. The worm had cast its earthly husk, and the spirit had spread its wings. Released from the laws of space and time, the all-understanding mind of the dead could be in sympathy with the elect among the living. With us, the elect, who have renounced the joys of sense and lived only to cultivate the pleasures of the mind. For us, the poets we worship still live. The minds that have been the light and leading of our minds are our companions and friends. We need no salaried mediums abracadabra to summon them, no weary waiting round a table in a darkened room, disturbed by suspicions of trickery. They come to us uncalled, as we sit alone in the gloaming, or wander alone over the desolate down, or by the long seashore. The poem we read is suddenly illuminated with the soul of the poet. The printed page becomes a message from the immortal mind. Tonight, in that silent hour, it was only of the dead, Vera thought, as she wandered from room to room in the house of fear, shrinking from the prospect of the long, sleepless hours, weary yet restless. Restlessness made her wander into regions that were almost strange. She drew aside a heavy curtain and pushed open a crimson cloth door that led from the hall of ceremony to those inferior regions common to servants and tradesmen. The long stone passage, with doors right and left, the passage that ended at the door into the stable yard, the door by which Mario Provana had entered on the night of his death. Rarely had her foot trodden the stone pavement, yet every detail of the place, the form of the doors, the white ceiling, the unlovely drab walls, had been burned into her brain. A single electric lamp gave the kind of light that is more awful than darkness. She heard clocks ticking, one that sounded solemn and slow, as if it were some awful mechanism that was measuring the fate of men. One with a thin and hurried beat, like the pulse of fever. She heard the heavy breathing of more than one sleeper, and presently, in front of the yard door, she came upon the watchdog, the Irish terrier, Buru. He was lying asleep on a rug in front of the door, and her light step upon the stone had not roused him. It was only when she was close to his rug that he started up and gave a low, muffled bark, and sniffed at the skirt of her dress, and being assured that she was to be trusted, sprang up with his forefeet upon her hip and licked her hands. She stooped over him and stroked his rough head, and let him nestle close against her, and then she knelt down beside him and put her arms round him 
and fondled him as he had never been fondled before by so beautiful and delicate a creature. From those long thoughts of a world peopled by the dead, the spontaneous love of this warm living creature touched her curiously. There was comfort in contact with anything so full of life and she laid her cold cheek against the dog's black nose, called him by his name, and made him her friend forever. Poor old dog, all alone in this cold place. Come upstairs with me. Come, Buru. The house dog needed no second invitation. He kept close to her trailing silken skirt as she moved slowly through the hall, switching off lights as she went, and so by the stately staircase to the second floor. The fire in her morning-room had been made up at a late hour by Louison, who was now accustomed to her mistress's nocturnal habits, and the logs were bright on the hearth, and brightly reflected on the hedge-sparrow egg-blue of the tiled fireplace. The terrier looked round the room with approval. Till this night he had seen nothing finer than Mrs. Manby's parlour, where— when occasionally suffered to lie in front of the fire, he had always to be on his best behaviour. But in Vera's room he made himself at once at home, jumped on and off the prettiest chairs, rioted among the silken pillows on the sofa, looking at her with questioning eyes all the time, to see what liberties he might take, and finally stretched his yellow-red body at full length in the glow and warmth of the hearth wagging a lazy tail with ineffable bliss. Vera seated herself in a low chair near him, and stooped now and then to pat the broad, flat head. He was a big dog of his kind, and though intended only for the humblest service, to rank with kitchen and scullery maids and under footmen, he was naturally, in that opulent household, a well-bred animal of an unimpeachable pedigree. His parents and grandparents had been prize-winners, and his blood might have entitled him to a higher place than the run of the servants' halls and stables, and a mat in a stone passage. But, whatever his inherited merits or personal charms, Vera's sudden liking for him had nothing to do with his race or character. It was the chill desolation of the silent hour, the freezing horror of the empty house, that had made her heart soften and her tears fall at the contact of this warm, living creature in the world of the dead. It was almost as if she had lost her way in one of the Roman catacombs and had met this friendly animal among the dead of a thousand years and in the horror of impenetrable darkness. "'You are my dog now, Baru, she told the terrier, and the small, bright, dark eyes looked up at her with a light that expressed perfect understanding, while the pointed ears quivered with delight. He followed her to the threshold of her bedroom, where she showed him a white fleecy rug on which he was to sleep, outside her door. He threw himself upon his back, with his four legs in the air, protesting himself her slave, and from that hour he worshipped her, and followed her about her house in abject devotion. He went with her to Italy. Of course there would be difficulties about his return to England, but canine quarantine might be ameliorated for a rich man's dog. He became her companion and friend, and it was strange how much he meant in her life. Strange, very strange, for in all the years of folly and self-indulgence, she had never given herself a canine favourite. She had seen almost every one of her friends more or less absurdly devoted to some small creature. Griffin, Manchester Terrier, Pekingese, Japanese, King Charles, Pomeranian, dogs whose merits seemed in an inverse ratio to their size, or the slaves to some more dignified animal, Poodle or Chow. She had seen this canine slavery, and had wondered with a touch of scorn. And now, in the stately spaciousness of the Roman villa, she found herself listening for the patter of the Irish terrier's feet upon the marble floors, and rejoicing when he came bounding across the room to lay his head upon her knee 
and express unutterable affection with the exuberance of a rough, hairy tail. The clue to the mystery came to her suddenly as she sat musing in the firelight, with Boru stretched at her feet. She had wanted this dog. She had wanted some warm-hearted creature to love her, and to be loved by her. It had been the vacant house of her life that called for an inhabitant. She had awakened from her fever dream of happiness to find herself alone, utterly alone, in a world of which she was weary. Claude Rutherford was of no more account to her. The thing that had happened was something worse than drifting apart. Gradually and imperceptibly the distance between them had widened until she had begun to ask herself if she had ever loved him. Boru went with his mistress on the long journey to San Marco, and behaved with an admirable discretion at the big hotel at Marseilles, where, though he would have liked to try conclusions, with a stalwart Dogu de Bordeaux that he met in one of the long corridors, he contented himself with a passing growl as he crept after Vera to his post outside her room. All things were strange to him in these first continental experiences, but he bore all things with sublime restraint, concentrating all his brain power and all his emotional force on the one supreme duty of guarding the lovely lady who had adopted him. At the Hôtel des Anglais, Mrs. Rutherford was received with rapture, and the spacious suite on the first floor was, as it were, laid at her feet. She would, of course, occupy those rooms, and no other, the rooms where Signor Provana and his sweet young daughter had lived. Signor Canincio ignored the fact that the sweet young daughter had also died there. No, Mrs. Rutherford would have the rooms in which she had lived with her grandmother. I want our old rooms, please, she said. The rooms in which you were so happy, where you spent two winters with the illustrious Lady Felicia. Signor Canincio at once perceived how natural it was for Madame to prefer those rooms. Everything should be made ready immediately. His season had not yet begun, but his hotel would be full to overflowing in December, when he expected many of Madame's old friends to settle down for the winter. Vera smiled as she remembered those old friends, with whom she had never been friendly. The sour spinsters and widows who had always resented Lady Felicia's determination to deny herself the advantage of their society. It was the dead season of the year. The late lingering roses on the walls had a sodden look. The pepper trees drooped disconsolately, and a curtain of grey mist hung over the parade where Vera had walked, alone and dejected, before the coming of Julia and her father. The hills where they had driven looked farther away in the shadowy atmosphere. There was no gleaming whiteness on the distant mountains. All was grey and melancholy, and in unison with her thoughts of the dead. She had come there to look upon her husband's grave. She had been prostrate and helpless at the time of his burial, and had only just been capable of arousing herself from a state of apathy to insist that he should be carried back to the country of his birth, and should lie beside his daughter in the shadow of the cypresses between the sea and the olive woods. Even in that agonising time, the picture of that familiar spot had been in her mind as she gave her instructions and she had seen the marble tomb in its green enclosure, and the tall trees standing deeply black against the pale gold of the sky, as on that evening when Mario Provana had found her sitting by his daughter's tomb. He must lie there, she told his partner, nowhere else, no, not even in Rome, where his family had their stately sepulchre. It was under the marble tomb he had made for his idolised child that he must rest. And now, in the dull grey November, she stood once more beside the marble and read the lines that had been graven under Julia's brief epitaph. 
also in memory of Mario Provana, her father, who died in London on July the 13th, 19 blank, in the 57th year of his age. And below this one word, reunited. She stayed long in the green enclosure, her dog coming back to her after much exploration of the wood above, where he had startled and scattered any animal life that he could find there, and the seashore below, where he stirred the tideless waves by the vehemence of his plunges. And then she went for a long ramble in the familiar paths where she had walked with Pravana in those sunny afternoons, before the ride to the chocolate mills. She stayed nearly a week at San Marco, repeating the same process every day, first a lingering visit to the grave, and then a long lonely walk in the paths she had trodden with a man whom she had thought of only as her friend's father, until, by an imperceptible progress, he had made himself the one close friend of her life. She took pains to find the very paths they had trodden together, the humble shrines or chapels they had looked at, the rocks where they had sat down to rest. When she had first spoken of revisiting San Marco, Claude had done his uttermost to dissuade her. Don't be morbid, he had said more than once. Your mind has a fatal leaning that way. You ought to fight against it. Yes, she knew that she was morbid, that she had taken to brooding upon melancholy memories, that she was cultivating sadness. Alone in the olive wood, watching the evening light change and fade, and the shadow steal slowly from the valley and the sea, while memory recalled words that had been spoken in that narrow pathway, among those grey old trees, in the light and shade of evenings that seemed ages ago, she had a feeling that was almost happiness. It was a memory of happiness so vivid that it seemed the thing itself. She had been very happy in those tranquil evenings. She knew now that she had begun to love Mario Provana many days before his impassioned avowal had taken her by storm. His eloquence, his power of thought and feeling, had made life and the world new. She saw Othello's visage in his mind. His rugged features and his eight-and-forty years were forgotten in the charm of his conversation and the rare music of his voice. The world of the scholar, of the thinker, and the poet, had been an unknown world to the girl of eighteen, whose poor little bit of flimsy education had been limited to the morning hours of a Miss Greenow at a guinea a week. He opened the gate of that divine world and led her in, and they walked there together. He charmed by her freshness and naivety, she dazzled by his wealth of knowledge and his power of imagination. Not even her poet father could have had a wider knowledge of books, or a greater power of thought, she told herself, which was a concession to friendship, as she had hitherto put her father in the front rank of those who know. She looked back at those innocent hours, when he who was so soon to be her husband was only thought of as her first friend. She looked back to hours that seemed to her to have been the happiest in all her life. Yes, the happiest. For happiness is sunshine and calm weather, not fever and storm. There were other hours more romantic and more thrilling, but agonizing to remember, sensual, devilish. Those hours in the woods had been serene and pure, and she had walked there with the heart of a child. How kind he had been, how kind! It was the kindness in the low grey voice that had made its music, only the kindness of a friend of mature years, interested in her youth and ignorance. Only a grave and thoughtful friend, liking her because she had been loved by his dead daughter. That is what she had thought of him for the greater part of those quiet hours. Yet now and then she had been startled by a sudden suggestion. She did not know, but she felt that he was her lover. It was in vain that Signor Canincio pressed her to occupy 
his piano nobile, as the only part of his hostel worthy of her. She insisted on the old rooms, the salon that had been growing shabbier and shabbier in the years of her absence, and which had never been redecorated. There were the same faded cupids flying about the ceiling, where many a crack in the plaster testified to an occasional earthquake. And there was the same shabby paper on the walls. Nothing had been altered, nothing had been removed. Vera went out upon the balcony and looked down at the little town and the distant ridge where the walls of a monastery rose white against the grey November sky. Everything was the same. She had wanted to come back. It was a morbid fancy, perhaps, like many of her fancies. She knew that she was morbid. She wanted to steep herself in the memories of the time before she was Mario Provana's wife the time when she knew that he loved her and was proud of his love. She walked up and down the room, touching things gently as she passed them, as if those poor old pieces of furniture, with their white paint and worn gilding, were a part of her history. This was the table where she had sat making tea, a slow process, while Mario stood beside her, watching her, as she watched the blue flame under Granny's old silver kettle, the George the Second silver that gave a grace to the cheap salon. Lady Felicia had kept her old silver, light and thin with much use, as resolutely as she had kept her diamonds. If ever I were forced to part with those poor things of mine, I should feel myself no better than the charwoman who comes here to scrub floors, she told Lady O'Campton and that kind lady, who was taking tea with poor Lady Felicia in her London lodgings, had approved a sentiment so worthy of a disbrow. Vera paced the room slowly in the thickening light, sometimes standing by the open window, listening to footsteps on the parade, and the talk of the women from the olive woods, tramping bravely homeward with heavy baskets on their heads, baskets of little black olives for the oil mills, that dotted the steep sides of the gorge through which the tempestuous little river went brawling down to the sluggish sea. And then she went back into the shadows and slowly, slowly paced all the length of the room, thinking of those evenings when she had made tea for the Roman financier. The shadows gathered momentarily and the shape of all things became vague and dim. There was Granny's sofa, and Granny was sitting there among her silken pillows. She could see the pale, thin face and the frail figure wrapped in a china crepe shawl. The white shawl had always had a ghostly look in a dimly lighted room. She went over to the sofa and felt the empty corner where Granny used to sit. No, she was not there. The sofa was a bare, hard object with nothing phantasmal about it. There were no silken cushions. Those amenities had been Lady Felicia's private property, travelling to and fro by petite vitesse. There was no one on the sofa, and that dark form, the tall figure near the tea-table, was nothing but shadow. It vanished as she came near, and there was only empty space, with the white table shining in the faint light from the open window. Nothing but shadow, she thought, like my life. There is nothing left of that but shadow. How happy I must have been when I lived in this room. How happy. But I did not know it. How sweetly I used to sleep, and what dear dreams I dreamt. I was only seventeen in our first winter, and I was a good girl. Looking back, I cannot remember that I had ever done wrong. I was always obedient to Granny and I tried hard to please her, and to care for her when she was ill. I always spoke the truth. The truth? Why should I have been afraid of truth in those days? There was no merit in fearless truth. But the difference, the difference. It seemed so strange now that she had not been happier. To be young and without sin, to believe in God, 
and to love Christ, was that not enough for happiness? The room was almost dark before she rang for lamps. In that southern paradise, the shutting of windows must precede the entrance of lighted lamps, and one is apt to prolong the time entre chien en loup. The darkness fostered those morbid feelings that she had indulged of late. She thought of Francis Simeon and his belief in the communion of the living and the dead. Her husband might be near her as she crept about in the darkness. She might know that he was there, but she was not to hope for any visible sign of his presence. To see was reserved for the elect and for them only when the earthly tabernacle was near its end, when the veil between life and death had worn thin. Then only, and for the choicest spirits only, would that thin veil be rent asunder, and the dead reveal themselves to the living, in a divine anticipation of immortality. Not for all, not for those who have loved earthly things and lived the sensual life, not for them the afterlife of reunion and felicity. Not for me, never for me. She fell on her knees by Granny's sofa and bowed her head upon her folded arms and prayed. A wild and fervent prayer, a distracted appeal for mercy to one who knew and could pity. Such a prayer as might have trembled on the Magdalene's pale lips while, with bent head, and hidden countenance, she washed the Redeemer's feet with her tears. The spell that was woven of silence and shadow was broken suddenly by the opening of the door and the tumultuous entrance of the Irish terrier, followed by Louison, who saw only darkness and an empty room. May you don't, eh, madame? she exclaimed. Guru had found his mistress by something keener than the sense of sight, and had pushed his cold black nose against her cheek, despite of the bowed head, and leapt about her as she rose to her feet, just in time to hide all signs of agitation, as Signor Canincio's odd man, in a loose red jacket, looking like a reformed bandit, brought in a pair of lamps and flooded the room with light. Louison rushed to shut the windows, and exclude cette affreuse bête les moustiques, from whose attentions she herself had suffered. Mais, madame, pourquoi d'y prendre son air? Vous y voilà sans lumière, sans feu, et les fenêtres grandes ouvertes. Ascenderai, donc, to the old man, a porte legno, molto legno, et faire un bon fuoco. Presto, subito, tout de suite may be that this noisy solicitude was meant to cover a certain want of attention to her mistress, Mademoiselle having lingered over the tea-table in the courier's room, where a dearth of couriers at this dead season was atoned for by the presence of Signor Canincio and his English wife, she dispensing the weakest possible tea, with condescending kindness, and wife and husband both alert to hear anything that Louison would tell them about her mistress while the animated gestures and expressive eyes of the host testified to his admiration for La Belle Francaise, an admiration that was made more agreeable to Louison from the consuming jealousy which he saw depicted in the countenance of the travelling footman, whose inferior status ought to have excluded him from that table. But Louison knew that Canincio's hotel had always been what Mr. Sedgwick called Une affaire d'un seul cheval. End of chapter 26, part 2